things, so water, land, feed, and uh, fish and feed, to see how these are going to be affected in the, in the coming years. Well, we heard that water is one of the most important, most important natural resources we have. There's very little of, of fresh water available, but in general, water use is, uh, is, is very restricted because of many uses that are needed for it. You need for industrial applications, you need for power generation, uh, you need for drinking, of course. And when it comes to aquaculture, you just can't have any production without water. And you need uh, water of a specific quality. You need to have clean water that, that, can be, that can be given to the fish so you don't have contaminated fish. So we're going to see that we're going to have to move to more efficient systems of producing fish. That means moving away from low, low intensity systems to high intensity systems, moving away from trash fish based systems or to low quality feed based, based systems to high quality feed based systems, and looking at to how we can, how we can improve, improve sustainability. Land is going to become more scarce, particularly in the coastal areas. We've seen this already in places like China. Areas in China that were formerly being used for aquaculture production, you know, for pond-based, land-based production near the coastal areas, now no longer can be used because they're building resorts or they're building housing developments in those areas. People want to live there, and so there's not, there's not any room anymore for aquaculture production in those areas. Also, for example, cages. I think some of you may be familiar with the concept of NIMBY, not in my backyard, where people are not, not, uh, not as happy to see aquaculture production systems off, their, uh, off the coast. So for example, in the United States, right now it's very difficult, if you wanted to create a cage aquaculture system near, nearby the shore, you had a very difficult time getting the permitting to do so. Well, we also saw in China, that's also becoming an issue where these resorts are saying, look, we don't want all these cages out here. We, wanna, we can make more money by bringing in tourists. So get rid of these cages and uh, you know, move somewhere else. So we're going to see that when it comes to cage aquaculture, we're going to need to move further offshore where cages cannot be seen. We feel that pond area globally will, will decrease. Uh, we talked about multiple uses of land by, by, by many industries. But the, the agriculture industry is going to have to increase. And so land is going to be taken up by that. And actually. Land, land, uh, good land for agriculture is also good land for aquaculture. There's a common misperception that any marginal land can be used for aquaculture, but that's not true. Usually when you're looking at aquaculture production, particularly of, of marine fish and freshwater fish in earthen ponds, the best, the best aquaculture production is actually in good ag agriculture land. So we see that, that uh, those areas that formerly could take by large areas of land and do low intensity production are going to have to contract and go into high intensity production in the future. Water use is a main, main issue. This picture actually is from one of, our, one of our projects in India. Now, in India, the areas we were going into, we were seeing that the farmers were really desperate for water. They were having, we were looking at all these empty riverbeds, we were looking at reservoirs that were, that were being drained, and what was happening is that they were using boreholes to get their water for their aquaculture operations. The problem with that is that their water table has been dropping very rapidly. Where it used to be 10 meters below the surface of the earth, now it's 150 meters below the surface of the earth. They have to keep on digging lower and lower to get that water. So one of the things that's going to have to happen is we're going to have to have zero exchange systems where water is, is either kept in the pond or constantly reused and not discarded. So you can't do a one-pass system where you use it and then throw it away. You have to reuse that water over and over again. Uh, because of those increasing land values, Ponds and, and hatcheries are going to have to move further inland. So these are particularly important for those high value marine species that uh, a lot of people enjoy eating. As I said, for marine aquaculture, we're looking that, that near shore and offshore aquaculture are going to rapidly expand, particularly here in Southeast Asia. There's a lot of areas around here in the Philippines, a lot of places in Indonesia and Malaysia and, and uh, Vietnam that could be used for, for cage aquaculture. And we see that this is an industry that's really rapidly, rapidly growing in these areas. But also, we're going to be seeing a move offshore, further offshore, to, to take advantage of better water qualities and to get away from, get away from some uh, multiple use issues nearby the sh near the shore. So one of the things that's going to have to happen is we're going to have to build up the capacity to work, work our way into offshore aquaculture. The ASAIM has been working on offshore cage aquaculture technologies, we call it OCAT, to, uh, 
to help address that. And here you can see it's actually, let's see, it would be on your right. We have uh, the cage, cages that ASA has been working with in, uh, in China, and we're looking to work in Southeast Asia as well. But there's other systems such as the, uh, the sea station and the, and the polar circle cages. And what's going to have to happen is that these cages are probably going to be moved offshore, and they're going to be sinkable. Now, why would you want to make them sinkable? Well, one of the reasons that it's very important to sink a cage that's offshore is because inclement weather. So you have a typhoon. Uh, you have problems with theft. If you put that cage out of sight and you can, you can continue to feed it under, underwater, that's going to be a much more effective technique for production of fish. And ASAIM has been working on, on that kind of technology so that these cages will self-sink in storm conditions. Uh, obviously, we see that the future is all fee-based. The, uh, the use of trash fish is, is something that is, is marginal because of disease issues because of uh, getting the, the trash fish itself from, the, from, the, from nature. And uh, trash fish is kind of a misnomer. Trash fish means small, small fish that are chopped up to make, to make sort of a, uh, a mash that's fed to, to the culture fish. The problem is those small fish actually have a value. They're the ones that feed the, ones that feed the wild stocks. Also, they often tend to be the juveniles of the wild stocks you're actually trying to have in, in nature. So, as people recognize this and they want to get away from high disease systems, they're going to move to feed-based technologies. So one of the things we're going to see is that, that uh, there's going to be a lot more work on finding out the correct dietary requirements for fish, and particularly for marine fish, because of the interest in high-value marine species. And that's going, to, that's going to be an ongoing process. Now, I have this discussion a lot with the technical director of animal nutrition. We talk about how the, the swine industry, the cattle industry, the poultry industry, you have study after study after study of these animals on what's the best, nutritional, uh, best nutrition for these animals. When it comes to aug culture, there's very little information on that. And what little information there is is often not, not actually repeated. So you'll have one paper which will discuss, will, dis, will do, do some research. It won't be repeated. And the next research will be based on that first paper. So there's actually an example for tiger prawns for tiger shrimp, that a lot of the research that's been done on that, on that species all comes back to one paper that was based on five shrimp in a research project. So if, if there was any problem with that, that one, one paper, then all the research after there might be flawed as well. So we're going to see a lot, more, a lot more research in the future on marine, marine feeds. Uh, we're also going to see a lot of gains on, on, in genetics. Now, this can be as simple as just doing strain selection by going through and actually identifying the best, the best uh, first maybe the best species to target, and then within each species, targeting the best strains within those species for maybe fast growth or disease resistance. Um, one of the problems we've had in the freshwater industry is inbreeding. So hatchery technology is going to be a very important aspect of the future for aquaculture. Uh, for marine species, we have a limited, limited toolbox of fish we can use right now that we have information on. But as more species uh, are, are identified for potential aquaculture use, they're going to be doing a lot more species and strain selection of those, of those kind of fish. And there's also going to be some opportunities for selective breeding and uh, genetic selection to improve both freshwater and marine species. Hatcheries, as I said, are, need, are going to need to modernize. Um, right now, you know, there's a lot of open hatcheries, but we're going to start moving probably to more recirculating systems with water purification, uh, intensive larval production, and intensive juvenile production, and especially SPC, SPF, which is specific pathogen-free production, or SPR, specific pathogen-resistant production, where we try to avoid the main diseases or the main problems with some species, such as shrimp, where we actually, we actually develop strains that are resistant or free of those diseases. We're going to do more research on target aquaculture species. That includes existing ones that we have, have today and new ones that will be coming in the future. ASAIM has been working on this. We have current projects right now with milkfish, pompano, uh, Asian sea bass, cobia, giant grouper. And uh, probably some of you have heard that there's a lot of activity, not by ASAIM, but by, by uh, the aquaculture industry with tuna because of the concerns of the wild stocks of tuna declining. Now, 